Good evening. I've, ever never, I've never spoken in this auditorium before, and I find the stage very bright, actually. Um, so, I'm Antje Danielson, as uh, Adam said. I'm the director of the Tufts Institute of the Environment. I'm actually following in Bill Moomer's footsteps in, in uh, that regard, because he was the very first director of the Tufts Institute of the Environment. Um, the reason why we're so delighted to have this conference here this weekend is, um, is grounded in the mission of the Tufts Institute of the Environment. Our mission is to support interdisciplinary environmental research, teaching, and outreach towards a sustainable future. And we do this through supporting uh, course development, through supporting faculty who want to engage in that type of a research, in that type of research, and we are doing this by supporting conferences uh, on very interesting topics that concern large global problems. And carbon capture is one of those large global problems. Myself, I'm a geochemist, so I'm um, a learner. I'm here mostly as a learner, and I'm really looking forward to learning a lot about um, biological carbon capture. I've done some work on geological carbon ca capture, and certainly there are some parallels there, but the, um, the biolog biological systems are a very different beast. Uh, I'm also hoping that a lot of our students will participate in this conference over this weekend. Um, you probably know that we have um, a School of Nutrition here at Tufts, and we have a program uh, in the School of Nutrition that is directly um, involved with environmental and agriculture research. So uh, hopefully our students will benefit greatly from this conference. And this is just about everything I want to say. And welcome to Tufts University. And I'm delighted to um, have the organizers here. And uh, I was delighted to support them. Thank you. Bill Muma has um, really got us started because uh, about a year and a half ago, he welcomed Alan Savory, who is famous for his approach to grasslands and eco-restoration. Um, Alan came here. It was the first time in 30 years that he had ever spoken in an academic institution because his views are so contrary to the current academic normal. And Bill went out on a limb, had Alan here, we had a full, a full audience, and then Alan came back nine months later and did workshops. And Bill has been exceptionally supportive at every step of the way. He, has, he is a physical chemist, a physical chemist who, um, has become a policy expert. He has been a lead author on five IPCC reports, not four, as I said in the booklet. And he is, has become an ardent advocate for what we're doing. He is now emeritus professor at Tufts and has become the chief scientist at Earthwatch. For those of you who may not know, it is an extraordinary organization building citizen science and giving people who don't necessarily have any science background an opportunity to work in the field and some of them blossom into full-blown scientists. So Bill has a, a rich background and he will be sharing that with you further as we go. Thank you, Adam, and uh, I'd just like to add my welcome to all of you uh, for coming here to Tufts for this event. Um, uh, Adam mentioned that I've been involved in a number of IPCC reports, which is true, uh, and uh, I started out as a, as a chemist being really interested in, the, in the, uh, the energy sector, and it's absolutely clear that we can no longer continue to burn fossil fuels the way we're burning them. 
Um, by the way, in addition to climate change, uh, the World Health Organization points out 3.7 million people die every year from air pollution associated with burning fossil fuels. We're going nuts over a very serious problem in West Africa, 5,000 people dying of Ebola. 5,000, 3.7 million. I don't see 3.7 million on the front page of the papers. I don't understand why. Um, so it's essential that we eliminate fossil fuels for health reasons. How many wars are undergoing, or are we undergoing because of oil and gas right now? Ukraine, Iraq, right? China and all its neighbors, Nigeria, Sudan, Darfur, you can go on and on. The list is incredible. And oh yes, there's climate change. Don't forget climate change. Um, one of the IPCC reports I worked on was called Carbon Capture and Storage. And I insisted in putting in a figure that showed all the places carbon came from and all the places it could go. And I wanted to add forests, soils, ecosystems. I got such pushback. Oh no, that was in the land use, land use change in forestry report we did two years ago, three years, four years ago, whatever it was. I said, yes, but we want to put this in perspective. This was all about capturing carbon dioxide from smokestacks and stuffing it in the ground someplace. But I just wanted to show what the places were and what were the relative amounts. It was a tough sell, but that's in there. I feel very good about that. I was ahead of my time on that one. <laughs> so at this event, which uh, actually started when Seth Iskun came to me and started talking about this, uh, all this uh, uh, restoration of, of grasslands that Alan Savory was doing and eventually as Adam said we brought Alan Savory here because I realized that um, you know even if we stop putting all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from fossil fuels we will not have solved the climate problem because we're not removing carbon dioxide rapidly enough from the atmosphere We've degraded forests so much that they can't pull it out. We'll hear about some forests here uh, uh, later in the program. Um, but the area that's gotten less attention in the scientific community is the soil that has been released to the atmosphere from, uh, or excuse me, the, the carbon that's been released to the atmosphere from soils and the potential of stuffing some of that back into soils, not in the way they were talking about putting it into the deep into the ground, carbon dioxide, but no, building carbon in soils, building carbon in restoring, while we restore the two thirds of grasslands of the world that have been, been degraded. And that was Alan Savory's message. And so I got very excited about this notion of restorative development. We've been doing destructive development. Wouldn't it be great instead of every, every year um, our agricultural soils were richer than they were the year before rather than poorer and we put them on life support with various chemicals and other things to keep them going? Wouldn't it be nice if they were really better because more carbon had been stored in those soils to make them more productive? Wouldn't it be great if the grasslands every year were actually more productive because they had been grazed properly and carbon had been stored in those soils. And oh, where does that carbon come from? It comes from the atmosphere. We would be helping the climate system as well. It's an extraordinary opportunity to think about and to try to understand what is possible using the biosphere, I like to say mobilizing the biosphere, um, it, uh, not just to, not, well, to, 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 uh, to, to bring carbon out of the atmosphere, but also to improve the lives and livelihoods of billions of people around the world. And so that's sort of the point of this conference. And I'm really grateful to the organizers for putting it all together. And I look forward uh, to uh, learning a lot along with you. Thank you for coming. I, I just want to say that this conference is meant for interactivity. So a lot of the speakers have been able to be here uh, all weekend and we encourage conversations and challenges and interactions of all peaceable sorts. And I also want to say that people in the audience are qualified to be speakers too. I mean, we've got a lot of very smart people here. So 
Let's, let's spread it all around. This is a conference of possibilities. And most importantly, the possibilities that we can help revive global biology to turn the world's climate around. Historically, global warming has been all about small molecules. It's been about the physical sciences. It's been mostly about carbon dioxide. It hasn't been about the biosphere as a whole. And it's becoming apparent that the small molecule definition is not working. The fact is that the Earth as we know it is a product of biology, mountains and lakes and grasslands and even the atmosphere. The atmosphere is an oxygen atmosphere all because of biology. If biology can do that, adjusting a few parts per million of carbon dioxide and equivalents should be well within the realm of possibility for such a power. We're finding that nature can work with astonishing speed when the pieces are in place. And at this point in history, we have a pretty good idea of what those pieces are. We don't know exactly how they work, and nature is so complicated that we'll never know exactly how it all works. But we know that the pieces do work together, and we know what to do to put them in place. So the concept of this conference is one very sharp focus, getting carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soils. We have to do it quickly according to nature's timetable, not according to political timetables, not according to the timetable of, well, we'd like more data, and we would like more data, and we're getting more data. But we have to act in a much faster mode. We have to manage land in ways that restore ecosystems and put carbon in the ground, and you're going to hear that over and over in many different ways this weekend. There are some people who have told us that they are skeptical about whether biology and ecosystem restoration can, in fact, reverse global warming. And I encourage all the skepticism, all the questions. We have, to, we have a lot more to figure it out. But while the science is still uncertain, we have professional scientists as well as citizen scientists who will report on what's up, and it's looking very, very good. In some ways, land managers, farmers, ranchers, pastoralists, and others are in the vanguard because their lands are life to them. They are keen observers and often passionate defenders of the land. They too are here to tell you what it looks like when a barren tract turns green and full of life in just a few years, when water returns to dry lakes and streams because biology does that, when people who had been dependent on outside Outside aid can once again feed themselves with abundance. And finally, we're joined by activists who work tirelessly to bring us a world we can live in. Many of us are parents and grandparents concerned about the futures of our own children and of children all over the world. We're people who spend untold hours after a long work day, after putting the kids, we start our activism day, late at night, and do it the next day and the next. People who persevere against ridicule, persecution, dismissal, against all odds, because the outcomes are so essential to our survival. Such a remarkable mix of people doesn't often have a chance to work together. We're all so busy, but here we are. This weekend is our opportunity to meet one another, learn from each other, move to action together on a united front, a front that has so many benefits that we should pursue it with all due haste. The key to life on Earth while we must reduce emissions and develop non-destructive energy strategies, the key to life on Earth is life itself. Restoring biodiversity and a livable climate through eco-restoration is at the very heart of the matter. Uh, I can skip that paragraph. I would be remiss not to mention a remarkable recent day, September 21st, 2014. I've been a climate activist for 15 years writing, rallying, petitioning, organizing, marching. But over the years, just about everybody around me was white, middle class, and middle aged. Overwhelmed by the climate urgency, I kept asking myself, where are the people of color? Where are the old people? Where are the kids? And then, on that remarkable, mild, sunny Sunday in September, there was a People's Climate March in New York City. And suddenly, 
I didn't, I didn't think it would be this hard for me to say, <laughs> to say this. Suddenly, almost as if by magic, there we were, all ages, all colors, all classes, all together. 400,000 of us with a single overarching purpose. Fix it, fix it, fix it. And finally, I knew where the kids were. While I was busy growing old, they, the first climate crisis generation, were busy growing into the magnificent young adults that are all around you today. And now we are all together, and hope is finally truly here. Thank you.